much. I'm on like, I'm like trench. Left, 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 left. Gotta go around. Oh. Bear Bryant is on him like a church. Okay. You walk in, I've never seen a museum. Uh, so this is Dr. Yorgo Topolitis with the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program, um, Mississippi Freedom Project. And uh, my first question for you is, what is your name and your date of birth? My name is Don Manning Miller, and my date of birth is 22539. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I uh, was born and grew up in Amory, Mississippi. What are the names of your parents and where were they born? My dad's name was Hugh William Miller. And my mom's name was Nell Marie Wimberly Miller. And um, my dad was born in Amory. I'm not sure where my mom was born. She was, uh, her father was an itinerant Methodist minister. So she was born wherever he stopped that day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what are the names of your grandparents and where were they born? My paternal grandparents were uh, Russell Miller and Minnie Mae Hale Miller. Russell Miller was born in Lafayette County outside of Oxford, uh, Mississippi. And um, my grandmother was born in Water Valley, Mississippi. Uh, my paternal grandfather was named, uh, believe it or not, Looney Benjamin Wimberly. And they called him LB all of his life because he didn't like to answer to Looney Benjamin. And he was separated from, uh, from my, my grandmother early on and I never really knew her. I have no idea uh, uh, about what her name was or anything else. Uh, they, um, LB was born in, uh, I think, Wimberly, Texas. Do you know what the cause of the separation was? Just no. by, okay. No, I know it cost him his ministry though, because in those days, if you were divorced, you couldn't be a, a Methodist preacher anymore. Um, so, whom from your do you do, if you if you know this, uh, whom from your family immigrated to the United States, and when? The original immigrant from Scotland, Robert Miller, came to uh, South Carolina prior to the Civil War. Okay. All right, so continuing with these demographic questions, uh, <laughs> what race do you identify as? Not a question I particularly like to answer. Caucasian, I suppose. What nationality do you identify as? I don't know what nationality is somebody born in Monroe County, Mississippi. <laughs> Whatever that is. Okay. And what ethnicity do you identify as? Beg your pardon? What ethnicity do you identify as? I, I, I don't know how to answer that question. I don't really have a, a, a ethnic identity. You're talking about like country of origin kind of thing? I'm, I'm looking for you to interpret that, however you understand it. Okay, then I don't have an answer for you. Okay. Okay. What is your sex? Male. And what is your gender? I'm cisgender. Okay. Do you subscribe to a religious faith? And if so, which one? <laughs> you guys have asked some hard questions. Um, <laughs> That I guess ought to be easy for most folks, but that was not an easy one for me. I was once ordained as a Mississippi Baptist in the days of my, my youth. And, uh, but I would say at this point in time that I'm more of an ecumenical meddler uh, and general irritant to Orthodox Christianity. Okay. Um. <laughs> Who did you vote for in the last national, state, and local election? Uh, I voted for Biden for, for president. Is that the election that you're, that you're speaking of? 
I voted for Democrats up and down the line nationally and in the state. Okay. Uh, who are you going to vote for in the upcoming election in November? Democrats up and down the line. Have you or your parents or your grandparents experienced any prejudice or discrimination here in the U.S.? Did your grandparents or, or parents tell you any such stories about experiencing prejudice or discrimination? We were the, we were the discriminators. We didn't, we didn't experience discrimination. Do you have any anecdotes you would like to share with us? I, I don't know where you want me to go with that. You want me to talk about slavery? <laughs> if that is, if that, if you have any memories of that, or well, I'm, if you, you were know, told, I'm, I'm not quite that old. I don't. <laughs> 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 I'm getting to be a pretty old coot these days, but not quite that old. Uh, my my family uh, came into the northern part of Mississippi uh, in uh, about 1836. Uh, and came into Pontotoc County. Pontotoc uh, was the site of the, uh, of the land sales of the U.S. government selling off all of the lands that they took from the Chickasaws. Uh, and so it was a thriving sort of a place that attracted people who wanted to make money. And uh, my great-great-grandfather was a lawyer who uh, had come from South Carolina by way of Selma, Alabama, and, and he came into uh, uh, Pontotoc along with his his dad and cousins, and and they ended they got bought a bunch of uh, of land and had uh, I think I believe it was three fairly large plantations in Pontotoc County and and uh, enslaved people and owned enslaved people. My uh, my great grandfather was a circuit judge uh, and traveled throughout North Mississippi uh, as a judge and was elected to uh, first the House uh, of Rep State House of Representatives and then as a state senator. And was a state senator in uh, the year of, uh, of separation from the Union and was one of the uh, uh, Committee of Twelve that drafted the, uh, the ordinance of uh, of separation from the Union. Um, he uh, was, became the commander of the 42nd Mississippi Infantry and was wounded fatally at Gettysburg on the charge of, uh, on charge of Cemetery Hill on July 3rd, 1863. My great grandfather, his son, who was his lieutenant and adjutant, was wounded in that battle, but he, he survived and was the one who came back to, uh, to live in, uh, outside of Oxford after the war. Um, have you? Ever I, guess, I guess I should say, in that context, you know, that often in uh, confrontations with various uh, white supremacist groups and racists and Klan folks and other folks over the years, as we fought in Mississippi, I've always one of the things I've always told them is, you can't out Confederate me. <laughs> uh, have you? ever taken any diversity, inclusion, and equality course in high school, college, or at work? Um, and if so, how did you feel about taking that course? Never had any of that kind of course in, in formal school, and I've been, I've participated in a, a good number of uh, dismantling racism workshops uh, done by nonprofit and anti-racist groups over the years. How do you feel about, what are your feelings about such I did, courses? I did a good bit of anti-racist training when I was working in Appalachia. How do I feel about it? I mean, I, I don't, it's hard to know how to, exactly how to answer that. I think it's, I, I, I think it is uh, extremely important to have bridge building initiatives that help white folks who are looking for uh, a way out of their uh, historical dilemmas uh, to learn what the nature of racism is like, the systemic uh, aspects of racism, the white supremacist aspects of racism, the extent to which white privilege and just being white uh, involves you in a certain amount of privilege and complicity, whether you know it or not or whether you want to be there or not. 
and uh, and can help can help um, white people move through coping with the dis historical disinformation that they're often subject to, but also to help them cope with the almost inevitable sense of guilt that white folks go through in trying to come to grips with that history and, and their involvement in it and in the residue of it in, in, in current life, help them with, with the goal of moving them beyond just being mired down white liberals sitting in their, in their uh, easy chair feeling guilty and turn them into allies and anti-racist uh, activists that can help us maybe change things in this country. So I'm, it's important, but I also believe that <clears throat> its potential impact is fairly limited uh, in terms of social change because it's hard to reach enough uh, individuals to build a mass of people that become a force for change through that kind of education program. So I think it's good, and, and uh, if, if done properly, I mean, one of the problems with all the diversity stuff that they were doing in schools and corporations and what have you is that they were all talking about um, individual prejudice and, uh, uh, you know, they, they were uh, very reluctant in many cases to even use the word racism and they, they, were, they ended up mostly being palliatives to help the white folks who went through them feel better about who they were and make the corporation feel like they were doing something about racism when they weren't. So, I mean, you know, a lot depends on the kind of program that, uh, that it is. Um, the uh, People's Institute for Survival and Beyond in New Orleans uh, had, had, a, had an extremely effective uh, workshop that they did all around the country, particularly in the South, but also in Appalachia. Um, and there was an, a, an outfit in uh, Boston for a while. Um, oh, what's the name of it? Um, peace Pro the, the, the something Peace Project. I can't remember. But Tina Oakham and uh, Kenneth Jones were the trainers that they employed, and they had a very uh, effective anti-racist training program that they did throughout Appalachia. And I sat in on that two or three times, and and Ken and I became real friends and corresponded until his uh, untimely death. But I hope that's responsive to your question. <laughs> yes, thank you. There's so many ways these things could go. I don't know where to take them. No, thank you. Um, which social justice issue or issues uh, are you most passionate about and most involved in? Um, and what is your level of involvement in related social justice movements? Well, I think I... I probably would have a reluctance to put them in any kind of hierarchical order. I will say that I have, for most of my adult life, um, pending developmental experiences, but for most of my adult life, I've considered myself an active anti-racist activist and have worked uh, in, in all of the various areas that that leads one to work in, but I mean, I have to confess, I'm one of Eric Coffer's last of the true believers because there are very few progressive issues that I'm not involved with some way or the other. Most recently, we organized a, a Ukraine vigil, and, uh, and when I say that we did this, we did it in Oxford, uh, Mississippi, which is the home of Ole Miss, not New Miss. And, uh, we, we organized a Ukraine vigil. We had a, uh, we had a big rally, uh, uh, for gun control, following the Uvalde uh, massacres. Um, we recently had a, a, a sizable rally, a couple hundred people, which is pretty big for a small town uh, after the road decision. Uh, so we, we've got, a, you know, we've got visions of a different kind of society we'd like to see. <laughs> so, you know, we, uh, we end up in, in some kind of confrontation or resistance to all the forces that work against those visions and those hopes that we have. So, yeah. How did you learn about these issues? Uh, sort of who inspired or supported you to get involved? Well, you want me to speak? 
historically or contemporaneously? I mean, you know, I mean, life spans a whole lot of years. Both. Uh, as I'm, I'm, I, I was ordained um, as a Mississippi Baptist preacher into about the most conservative religious milieu you can imagine. When I was about 24 years old, I had been working in the record business, making music up in uh, Asheville and selling records around the country. And uh, part of my job uh, as the A&R person for the record label was uh, to peddle records all over the South. So I had a circuit that I that I ran, Texas from Florida, from Miami to El Paso and San Antonio, uh, Dallas and around, and all the cities in between. But part of that, and the artistic part of it, I love. Uh, I've been a disc jockey since I was 15 years old and had been in, involved in music uh, for, forever. Um, but the, the, the downside of that experience was that in the part of my work that I was doing, to actually uh, make the records available for sale and push them and market the records, I came up against some of the most brutal and uh, and the vicious uh, aspects of capitalism that you can get into in uh, in in business. I mean, you know, the mob was involved in what was called the rack job and jukebox uh, aspects of that those areas, and the huge record companies would just plow over you in every way that they possibly could. You know, I'd be in. Shreveport, Louisiana, begging a distributor to take 25 of my records free uh, to make them available. You know, the guy from Capitol Records would be standing next door with uh, all the big artists and all the, the big geetas, uh, giving you know, paying the guy essentially uh, to merchandise his records. You know, giving them, you know, it was, it was just a, it was a hard experience and very disillusioning for me. Uh, and I went through a down period and. <clears throat> my my way out of it, for better or worse, was uh, uh, without developing a lot of detail on along that line, uh, getting bitten by what I um, found attractive about the Judeo-Christian tradition, which was the uh, the, pro <clears throat> the proactive humanistic ethic of Jesus, as I understood it, and um, the alternative value system. I was never, well, I shouldn't say never. I mean, I went through a fundamentalist period because I never heard of William James and didn't know how to interpret any of it except in those fundamentalist categories. But essentially, I was never uh, uh, inspired to get into it so much for any notions of life after death. I was more interested in life before death. But uh, uh, getting into uh, that um, uh, area, and then with the uh, with the and and being very very enthusiastic about it and committed to it because I saw it as a as a as an exciting relevant alternative to the capitalist struggle that I decided I did not like, and uh, so I you know I, I definitely was a a true believer in the sense that I was involved in it in the sense of my commitment to it. So when the civil rights movement came along. Um, Although the local the church, the state church, most of the churches, as we know it, and brick buildings on the corner, were all in reactionary stances to it. Essentially, the uh, the ecumenical, the national ecumenical churches were basically all on the right side of the civil rights movement, at least in the earliest days of it. So there was a lot of literature, theological and and, and uh, Christian ethical uh, literature available uh, coming down the pike. And although the school that I was going to, that I was in, in biblical studies in, uh, was extremely conservative and retrospectively reactionary, um, I was my mind was always curious. So I, I was hooking up with uh, some fairly progressive bookstores up in Memphis and, uh, and 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 getting other ways to understand and look at things and. Uh, so I got turned on. I, I, in fact, I've said over the years, uh, jokingly, that I was born again by the Civil Rights Movement, which redirected my, uh, my life, uh, uh, you know, completely uh, during that, particular, that period of time. Um, my church was over in Union County and outside of New Albany, which is about 30 miles from here, out in the boondocks. And uh, I... Uh, 
was was taking a sociology course at Ole Miss, graduate course at Ole Miss, and uh, they. Uh, <laughs> And while I was at Ole Miss, I fell in with some young Turks, some preachers, some young Turks who were campus ministers mostly uh, at Ole Miss. Uh, Jimmy Jones, the Methodist campus minister, who later became uh, uh, deeply involved in the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement and various aspects of progressive things that were going on here. Wayne, can't remember last name, uh, who was the Episcopal preacher, uh, and there was a, a Presbyterian involved in it and some students and lay people and we had a little group and we were studying advanced theology once a week and uh, so anyway I got to the point where I said to him one, one time when I, there, I said well look guys I feel like I've got to the point where I have to do something within this Baptist uh, this deadly Baptist uh, culture that I'm part of and I said the, uh, the Mississippi Baptist Convention meeting is coming up in uh, in Jackson pretty soon so you know, I think what I'll do is uh, offer a resolution asking the Baptist Convention to go on record in favor of uh, integration of the Baptist colleges and schools in the state. And uh, so, along with my young Turk preacher friends, we drafted a, a resolution to present to the uh, conference. And so I went down there and presented it. and. Uh, you know, it was pretty lonely, pretty lonely place. And uh, the uh, the convention, which it often did when things that it didn't want to deal with came up, you know, of course, referred it to a committee and then found bureaucratic reasons for not bringing it to the floor uh, of the convention. I did have a chance to speak to it. Uh, and there was one other Baptist preacher a whole bunch, hundreds, 500, 700, maybe a thousand people representing Baptists from all over the state, white Baptists, of course, you know. And out of that whole group, there was one other Baptist preacher that was that was slightly uh, favorable uh, to what I was saying, but it was basically just me and and, and me and him. But when, uh, when I got back to Union County, uh, the local newspaper in New Albany had run a front page headline saying local pastor advocates race mixing. So uh, when I actually got back to, to my house, my, my, uh, my deacons had uh, called on my wife and, and told, them, told her to tell me they wanted to see me at 6 o'clock that night and that, that they did not want me back in the pulpit uh, again. So uh, I ended up getting kicked out of my church, which was fine because I had really already decided that that the church was going to be the last institution in the world to ever come into what was then the 20th century. So I was looking for other ways to try to be relevant and to exercise what I saw as my faith. And since we're concerned to some extent about Holly Springs, let me, let me put a little Holly Springs wrinkle into all this. The president of the Mississippi Baptist Convention in, in, in those times was, um, was uh, oh, what was Earl's last name? I, I, sometimes I have to try to remember who I am and from the time I get up in the morning to noon these days, but um, uh, I'll, I'll probably think of it in a minute. But anyway, the president was Earl, uh, I just can't think of his name right now, who was the minister of the First Baptist Church in Holly Springs. And one of the things I did when I decided I was going to, uh, I did two or three things to try to test the water before I offered my, res uh, my, uh, my resolution. I wrote a letter to the State Baptist uh, Record, the State Baptist newspaper, uh, to see what the reaction would be there. And um, at that time, I was I, I was the the monthly radio preacher for the local radio station in New Albany, and I gave a preview of what I was going to do on that radio program. But I contacted Earl uh, and, uh, and and Holly Springs and. Told him I'd like to talk to him, and he sort of came over to Holly Springs, met with him in his office, at First Baptist uh, Church here, you know, and told him what I was planning to do. And he says, "Well, you know," said I'm going to, uh, I'm going to make a strong statement on race this at this convention too. So man, I was just happy as a lark. I thought, well, you know, if the president of the convention is going to make a 
strong statement on race, that'll set a favorable context. I mean, I, I was under no illusion that it, <laughs> what I was proposing was ever going to be approved. That wasn't the issue. The issue was the, the, uh, the challenge, uh, the moral challenge, moral ethical challenge to, uh, to, to the convention. But I, I was happy, you know, so we, and we talked for a while. And uh, he said, you know, and, and near the end, he said, he said, well, I guess you believe in integration of the local church, too. You know, I said, well, yeah, I guess I do. He said, well, I don't, I don't believe in the integration of the local church. He said, you know, our, our mission is to save souls for Jesus Christ, and I believe white folks can save white souls and black folks can save black souls better than, uh, better than a, an integrated situation. He said, you know, out there at that Russ College, said they had a, uh, a chaplain out there named Clifton Whitley. And he said, he came down here one day and quoted Dietrich Bonhoeffer to me. He said, you know, he said, he said that's a German theologian. Of course, by that time, I'd read everything Bonhoeffer had written, uh, but he was, you know, assuming that me being a, a typical young Baptist preacher without any uh, particular theological exposure, that I wouldn't have, wouldn't, wouldn't have heard of it. But the the end of the story is that, that when the convention came and it was his time to make his speech, his strong statement on race was, "We're going to have to deal with this race problem one of these days." <laughs> So he didn't give me much cover, <laughs> but but anyway, that's 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 the way I got into things, and and frankly, I I uh, once I got t turned on uh, to the civil rights movement and made the firm conclusion that the good old Mississippi way of life simply wasn't compatible with the Christian ethic as I had come to understand it. You know, it was all over. I mean, that, you know, I, I was I, I skipped over being a moderate and a liberal and and became a radical and a very angry radical and militant uh, pretty much overnight, uh, very angry at what I saw had been done to uh, some of the fine black people that I was meeting in various milieu that I was engaging with at that time. And, uh, and um, you know, so that's 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 the start of the story anyway. Uh, who would you say inspired you or supported you along the way um, in, in, your, in your activism? Well, of course, those young Turks over there in, in Oxford, uh, you know, were supportive of me in, in that period of time. And, they, and, and you'd almost have to say the entire national ecumenical church, both Protestant and Catholic, were in, in, the, right, in the right corner and, and, uh, and were giving you... Uh, um, Information and education and 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 and, and motivation to uh, to be involved. There was really no local uh, people that were particularly uh, um, supportive or encouraging. Uh, after I got thrown out of my church, Will Campbell uh, contacted me. You all you all know who Will Campbell is. <laughs> no. Okay. Well, Will D. Campbell. Uh, He's, he, he's, he's a pretty well-known novelist. He, he, uh, he's written, uh, he, he wrote a number of best-selling uh, novels uh, over time. Uh, but he, uh, he had been the, uh, old, the Baptist uh, uh, student minister at Ole Miss. Uh, let's see, what years would that have probably been? Uh, I would guess uh, in the late 50s would be my guess. Uh, but he had... Uh, had opened the facility, the Baptist facility on campus to some black kids. Mostly they were coming in and playing ping pong and the like and the thing. And he ended up getting run out, run away from Ole Miss uh, uh, because of that and uh, had gone, gone to uh, Nashville and worked for something called the Committee of Southern Churchmen. Basically, he was a, a, a sort of a chaplain minister vagabond gadfly who traveled around from one civil rights hotspot to the other trying to, uh, to, to be supportive of the civil rights activists and trying to be a mediator between the activists and uh, the white power structures of the, of the town uh, that were there. And uh, anyway, he, uh, he reached out to me and invited me to come to uh, spend a weekend on his farm outside of Nashville you know, which was pretty tall cotton for me because Will was pretty well known in the civil rights uh, area. So I went and spent the, uh, the weekend with him. 
uh, a lot of people who may perhaps see this will know who Will Campbell is, whether you all do or not. Uh, and so I'm going to say a couple of things about that weekend that, that might resonate with people who do know who he, who he is. Um, one of his novels was had uh, a lengthy section in it about his relationship to his goat that he owned on this farm, you know, and, the, and one of the vivid memories I have is that I spent a great deal of the weekend trying to keep his goat from biting me. And so, so I had a whole different relationship to his goat than, uh, than, than the beloved goat that people knew in the literary world. Uh, but he also had a lot of advice for me about my, my ministry and my life and this, that, and the other. Of course, you know, I was young and opinionated and on a roll. One of the things he told me was, he said, remember, Miller, you're a, you're a preacher, not a social engineer. You know, and I'm sitting there thinking, well, man, I'm, I'm heading out to be a social engineer just as quick as I can possibly get, get in the streets, you know. <laughs> and I'd been a teetotaling Baptist preacher for a number of years. Uh, and uh, the first night I was there, uh, he poured himself a, a water glass three quarters full of Furman whiskey with no ice and no no mixer, no nothing, you know. And he offered me a offered me a drink, you know. And uh, I mean, I wouldn't have had any particular pseudo moral uh, reason necessarily for saying no, but I'd just been a teetotaler for a number of years. I'd been a heavy drinker earlier when I was in college and around, but I hadn't I hadn't been drinking anything during the years I was in in uh, the ministry in the ch when I had a church because you just never know when church people are going to show up. I mean, you know, it's just... So anyway, I said, no. I said, no, I don't think, think so. And he looked at me for a minute, looked at his whiskey, looked back at me. He thought, says, Miller, if you believe in Jesus and live south of Memphis, you can't do without it. <laughs> Which I found pretty much to be the case. <laughs> uh, Anyway, so I mean that was that was encouraging. He hooked me up with some progressive uh, Southern Baptist in Louisville Seminary and places where I went around and met some other folks. But the the, the folks that became uh, that eventually, but you know, fairly quickly became supportive were people in the civil rights movement. You mentioned Louisville, so I have to ask: Do you did you um, uh, collaborate with the Brands and Brandon? Yeah, the other person who reached out to me. Uh, uh, after I got thrown out of my church was Ann Braden. Uh, and Ann and Carl uh, uh, arranged to get together before, before too very long. And there was very few white folks, young white folks particularly, who got a twinkle in their eye who didn't ultimately hear from Ann and Carl. I mean, they covered the, they covered the waterfront in terms of wanting to be sure that as young white folks uh, indicated uh, that they were ready to break out of the Magnolia jungle or whatever it was they were in, uh, that they knew that they weren't alone, you know, that there were that there were other Southern white people who were looking for change and, and, and had a network of people who were supportive of each other. I have a lot of history with them. I was I became part of their organization later on, a member of the board of SCAF, and uh, did, did a lot of work with uh, with Ann and Carl and with CF over a longer period of time. Good bit of history and spent a good bit of time in Louisville. Could you speak to that? Do you have any anecdotes that you'd like to share with us? <laughs> uh, I, 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 I don't think it would be productive or understandable to get into much of the dynamics of the very complicated um, history of SCAF and its ultimate demise. But uh, I will just say that it was an extremely important organization to to many of us for a, for a, a long period of time in sustaining uh, commitment and work agendas uh, after the main thrust, even after the main thrust of the civil rights uh, movement was over. Uh, the first time I went to Louisville, after Nixon was uh, elected, uh, you may or may not recall, I don't know, you, you may be old enough to recall some of this, you guys are, uh, but uh, Nixon had a an IRS hit list. He sick the IRS on all the nonprofits in the country that were causing problems in his in the minds of his advisors, and Skeff was high on the list, hit list for the IRS. And so Ann 
put out a SOS to all of us who were in the network. He says, does anybody out there know anything about accounting or, uh, or tax stuff, you know? And uh, I'd been in business school at Mississippi State for three years and had a little bit of a background and had done something. I certainly wasn't an accomplished anything, but so I said, well, you know, yeah, I mean, I mean yeah, I've got, got some of that, you know? So they said, well, you know, can you come to Louisville and help us fight this IRS uh, thing that we're, that we're fighting? And so I said, sure. At the time, I was, I was working about half the year as a consultant doing training, bureaucratic training for some government agency or something or other. So I had a good six months a year I could spend doing raising hell. And uh, so I said, sure, I'll come. So, you know, so I went down to the local bookstore and I bought uh, Accounting Made Easy and how to answer accounting problems, how to solve accounting problems, and got on a Trailways bus, and, you know, which took me uh, well overnight, uh, probably a full day to get to Louisville and read those books on the way to refresh my accounting and bookkeeping knowledge, my expertise. <laughs> <laughs> and I get to Louisville, and Skeff had two old houses down on down on West Broadway in in the uh, in the African American section of town. Uh, one of them was uh, both of them were just old houses. Uh, one of them was the office building, and the other was sort of a community center that they had set up that wasn't used very much. So I get there, and uh, I remember who it was, Mike Welch or somebody. I said, "Where you know, where are your?" Records, where your financial records, you know, something shut up. What am I they work with? So they, they took me to the to this door and they opened the door and it was at the top of the head of the stairs going down into the basement. And down in the basement there was what looked very much like there had been an explosion in a paper factory. <laughs> and so they said, those those are the financial records. <laughs> Which were, you know, like boxes of canceled checks and stuff that they'd been dumping down the stairways. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I had I, I, I took my, my bedroll and my sleeping bag and and uh, and my and got a calculator and went over into the community center and got folding long phone to table set up, put my calculator on it, had my sleeping bag down there uh, next to it and started moving boxes of paper over and literally spent six months uh, reconstructing five years of financial records and, uh, and statements for the organization. And we ended up uh, uh, getting through the IRS thing without any, without any sanctions. But as I have often told people, I got uh, uh, a master's degree in counting, accounting uh, from that uh, experience. And, and strangely enough, uh, so little is known, or was particularly in those days, there's more of it now, but in those days, so little was known about nonprofit accounting that I, I really did know more than uh, even the CPAs that, that we got to work with us to uh, certify the reports and things like that. So, you know, it was an interesting period of time. And the curse of that was that I, could hardly, I hardly ever was able to escape uh, having to do bookkeeping and accounting work because nobody else ever wanted to do it in any of the other organizations that I was in. The positive side of it is that it uh, paved my, my way to be employed ultimately by Rust College um, at a later stage in my, in my life. But uh, that's, that's one interesting story about, uh, about SCAF. I, you know, I mean, there's, there's so many stories. I mean, you know, I, I was in, uh, in Jackson most of the time Jackson, Mississippi, most of the time during those days. And Carl used to come into town, and I loved Carl. Uh, old grizzly bear, uh, you know, brusque, uh, blunt, uh, pull, took no prisoners kind of a guy. But I, I, I loved him, and he'd been a journalist, and he'd been a labor journalist. And he, he was, I'm one of those folks who writes sort of like William Faulkner, you know, my singer, sentence start, without any of his talent, but my sentences start here. And, wind around through phrases and clauses and get somewhere and Carl used to hate that you know so he would he would uh, he would chastise me and say you know you got to write where real ordinary working people can understand what you're 
what you're writing. And he would give me books like, you know, The Art of Plain Talk and stuff and edit my, 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 my stuff, which was all to the good. I, I'm, I'm afraid it hadn't, hadn't stuck as well as it, I wish it could, but I still aspire to it to a certain degree. I certainly remember it. And, uh, but he would come in, you know, I, mean, I remember him coming into to Jackson when the, uh, when this Cesar Chavez uh, nationwide lettuce strike uh, was in force. I don't remember exactly what year that would have been, but anyway, we, we, we were, we, we, our, our group in Jackson, the Greater Jackson Area Committee was involved in the lettuce strike. Carl came in and we were in this restaurant in downtown Jackson uh, where things like lettuce strikes weren't terribly popular. Uh, and we were sitting there and Carl orders and he looks at his plate and first thing, next thing I know, Carl's throwing lettuce across the room against the wall, griping and complaining and shouting about, uh, you know, sell, selling lettuce and breaking the boycott and stuff. You know, we were all sitting there wondering if we are going to die. <laughs> you know, are, are we going to get back? Are we going to get back to, our, to the relative safety of our, of our office before this guy gets us shot? <laughs> But that's just one thing that comes to mind. I mean, you know, there's you know, lots of different stories. What about Anne? Can you speak to sort of an anecdote in your experience with Anne and collaborating with her? Anne Braden. Just yeah, I know, I know who you're talking about. No, I just wanted to put it on the record. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I spent lots and lots and lots of time with Anne. She was not the same kind of peculiar character that Carl was. Um, she was she was an extremely knowledgeable, extremely sophisticated Southern anti-racist who understood what it was all about and had a knack for helping other people understand what it was all about and a high level of journalistic commitment to keeping those issues and the ethics of those issues, um, both in the public eye and in the organization itself, um, so that we could try to more or less be on on the same page. I had a great deal of admiration for Anne, might say love for Anne, um, honor her memory, um, grateful for the for the impact and the work that she and Carl and Jim Dabrowski, their predecessor. Uh, had on on southern southern life, or at least on catalyzing southern resistance and southern operation. I don't know that we changed southern life all that much, but we did we did manage to find subcultures of uh, of resistance and uh, people who wanted to be part of the solution instead of part of the problem. So um, uh, you know, I have uh, fond memories of her. We used to, you know, we. We were serious about the business we were doing, and all of our meetings were big meetings. Skiff networks came together, fairly large meetings. And they were always like home uh, family reunions in a way with lots of singing and, and, and partying in addition to meeting, you know. We used to, uh, uh, after the business meetings were over, you know, we used to sit around and drink what I came to call Queen Anne cocktails. She, you know, she loved to take uh, rot gut bourbon, Heaven Hill, Heaven Hill bourbon and orange juice, mix it about half and half, and we'd sit around and drink Queen Anne cocktails until we were all rolling on the floor and <laughs> ready to get what sleep we could before the meeting started the next day. Um, did your parents or any of your family members participate in, in any social justice movements, organizations, or or, pro or protests? And you know, did they share with you anything about their experiences? Uh, no, they they were definitely uh, not involved in anything progressive at all. They were uh, typically uh, racist um, folks, um, as are all white folks who were socialized into Mississippi life in those days, including myself. Um, you know, our family, having been fairly extensive landowners prior to the Civil War, um, you know, sort of like a, sort of like the uh, the old rich in, in 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 New England. You know, folks that don't have any money anymore but still have the mystique. So uh, you know, they 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 were what you might call uh, uh, 
part of a historic Southern elite that now had no longer had any claim to being elite, uh, but were what I guess Robin DiAngelo would call nice racist in that they didn't go around using the N-word uh, all the time, although I can't say I never heard it, um, for sure, uh, in the family and out. Um, but, uh, but they were not, they were, they were part of, uh, they were part of uh, the white supremacist culture of, of Mississippi and wouldn't have been uh, progressive. My, my dad uh, uh, ran a crew on the, uh, for the city for a, while, for a good while. He had started out as an electrical lineman for the city and ran a crew of folks that included uh, a good number of black workers. And, uh, and he, he, would, he would do things like, uh, he would complain bitterly to me occasionally about how they weren't paid, how they did all the work and weren't paid. Uh, the equivalent of what he and other white folks were paying, and those 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 things had a had an impact on me, and I think were helped to some degree prepare me to think somewhat differently. And, and I became close friends with some of those working people. We I was a big outdoors person when I was a kid. And, you know, I hunted with uh, with uh, with those folks who that he worked with, Ira Bailey, and some of those folks, and got to be real real close to and, and personal admirers of of them as, as human beings. So, you know, it was, it was you know, those, those, those were complicated days, you know. They used to, uh, you know, they used to say uh, in the South, they don't care how close you get to black folks as long as they don't get big. And in the North, you don't care how big they get as long as they don't get close. And there was something to that. I mean, there, because we lived in a world in which there was a certain closeness of interaction and presence of black and white people together with blacks always in subordinate uh, uh, roles, but, uh, but we knew each other. And at least in my case, some of that knowing uh, had an influence in, in, I think, in my later openness to, uh, to relationships and to, to looking at things in different ways. You know, that's, uh, there was one black guy who worked for the funeral home, uh, George Darden, who uh, was a great guy, and, and he talked to us, talked to us you know, white folks all the time. You know, <clears throat> you know, we 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 call it, we didn't call him Mr. Darden, we called him George because his white folks, little white boys, we didn't know any better. But we all came to respect uh, George Darden uh, a great deal, and uh, I uh, give him a lot of credit for uh, for helping me. Uh, see alternatives. Uh, I, uh, I remember after I'd gone off to Mississippi State, when I came back uh, home for a weekend, one time I ran into Mr. Dar Darden on the main street in Amory, and he was coming down. And I mean, I had always had a lot of affection for him. And without even thinking what I was doing, I stuck my hand out and said, how you doing? How you doing, George? And he hesitantly stuck his hand out finally. But, you know, but I, he, I, I, I realized later that uh, that what I was doing spontaneously as a human, unthinkingly human gesture uh, was threatening, both surprising uh, and, and threatening to him and, 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 and was probably the wrong thing to do, uh, however well intended it might have been. But later I, uh, I, I, I was able to meet uh, uh, his son and his wife and and, and others and have some kind of relationship with him. And when he died, I was asked to speak at his funeral. Which was an honor. And, uh, and later uh, asked to be the speaker at Martin Luther King Day in West Amory, uh, which also was a great honor. I don't go home very often, but uh, I still have a brother that lives in Amor, but uh, don't go don't go very often. I've stayed about as far away from it as I could get, mentally if not physically. <laughs> and uh, but going back to uh, speak at Mr. Darden's funeral and going back to uh, speak uh, to speak uh, at Martin Luther King Day uh, ceremonies was uh, high points uh, for me. Uh, could you sort of speak to your to your activism? What specific groups or, or groups of groups would you say 
sort of the your activism um, uh, supported or aided in some way. So, it, so for example, African Americans, Latinos, Indigenous, LGBTQ um, me well, members. Just to say I supported or aided would be better to say that supported and aided me. Um, you know, the 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 subculture, the civil rights subculture in Mississippi was not a huge group. <laughs> it was <laughs> it was it was probably larger than most outside people recognize, but it was still a relatively small group of folks. After I got thrown out, how many? Give or take. Well, if you take in the whole the sweep of the whole state, uh, hundreds, because you know the civil rights movement activated hundreds and hundreds of folks, most of them black, right? So I mean, there were there was a if you if you uh, if you're speaking of the broad movement in Mississippi, it was it was large. Uh, white participation in it. If I had to just make an outside guess taking a statewide thing, I'd say maybe 200 people. What do you think, Larry? I, you know, that, that uh, hard, hard, hard to say. But the, but the point that I'm making is that, that once you became active in the, in the movement uh, and were participating in, in movement events, uh, you, you really sort of got into just about every organization that that there was in the state, they were more con more well. I wouldn't say conservative, but more uh, less militant organizations like the Mississippi Council on Human Relations, which was the one place in the state where black and white people of all ilks came together, from white moderates to <coughs> so-called white liberals. <coughs> With black middle class folks and civil rights workers and others, so it was a sort of a seeding ground for relationships in the state of of just about everybody who was involved in things. So it was an important organization, even though, in retrospect, we all felt like it was conservative in some ways, um, not the best kind of leadership for the movement that that we would hope for or, or would think would be most productive. But nevertheless, it it did have an important role to play, in my mind, coming into it from the angle that I did, coming out of the white uh, rea Mississippi reality and coming into the movement in that way, it was a bridge for me in some ways. But when I, when I got thrown out of the church, I, the first thing I did was I just I got in my car and drove all over the state and looked up every civil rights leader that I'd ever heard of. Drove to Clarksdale, met Aaron Henry, Cleveland and met Amzie Moore, Greenville and met Warren McKenna and Owen Brooks and, uh, uh, I can't even remember who all, but then to Jackson and then, you know, met, met all the folks that were there. I'd met a good many of them before through the Council on Human Relations, but I was establishing network relationships. So, you know, I, I met all those folks. But as I, as I said, I, I really became an angry militant. Um, I was not um, um, an incrementalist to search for some kind of a word. I wanted a revolution. <laughs> and uh, so I was drawn to the more militant elements of the civil rights movement, people in CORE and SNCC primarily. And, and uh, Walter Collins, who was a SNCC uh, activist, was probably my mo single most influential mentor during that time. But I knew a good many CORE activists and, and people who had come into the state for the summer of 64 um, through the National Council of Churches, ministerial folks that I that gravitated to me, and I gravitated to them because of my background in uh, in uh, religious life. Um, and most of them were, were very uh, were very militantly committed too, even though they were coming from a from a religious background. They they came basically in '64 to be sort of chaplains to the to the people who who came for the summer of '64, but. The ones who stayed became a civil rights organization in their own right. It was uh, the the original organization was called the uh, 
well, it was called the, the, the National Commission, the National Council of Churches Commission on the Delta Ministry. And we always called it the Delta Ministry for short. And even shorter, we, we, we usually just referred to it as the DM. But that brought uh, a whole lot of really good people into the state, and, uh, and they were really supportive and uh, influential during that time. I'll tell, I'll tell you one, one story about Walter. Walter, uh, later on, when Ann and Carver left SCEF, Walter became the executive director of SCEF, but that was down the line from, from the period that I'm talking about. But one, one, of the, one of the things that Walter said to me that made a lot of difference in my way of engaging um, life in, in Mississippi as it related to, to specifically uh, black liberation and racial issues was, he, he says, uh, Don, the reason white people don't understand what's going on with black people is they'll only listen to black people that are polite to them. And most of us don't feel polite. So if you want to listen, if you want to learn what's really going on, you got to be willing to listen to some things that will be painful. Uh, how did your family respond um, to learning <laughs> of, uh, of your uh, inclination to be a militant, a militant activist, uh, your parents or your immediate family? We had, in our extended family, which revolved around my paternal grandmother and grandfather primarily, very, very deep blood family ties and, um, and relationships. And um, I had been somewhat of a contrarian on other things as a high school student. And uh, you know, so they were used to occasional deviations from the party line. But essentially what we did was we, 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 we reached uh, an agreement that we just simply wouldn't talk about religion and politics in order that we could keep uh, civil family relationships because I was unrelenting. I mean, my position was if they, if they uh, chose to reject me over that, that, that so be it. I mean, I, my, my path was, my path was laid. Uh, my commitment was, uh, was such that I, I wouldn't have been deterred, but basically we worked out a, a relationship that might not have had a whole lot of integrity in some ways, but at least made it possible for us to, uh, to sustain uh, a fa family relationships. Now, uh, Later who, on, later who on. Who enforced what? that? I'm sorry. Who enforced that in the family circle? In your family circle? Uh, who enforced that in your family circle? Yeah, it was just sort of an agreement. It was just sort of a consensus agreement. I wouldn't say there was any enforcement at all. Um, was there know, any? Was there any point like in your family, in your home, where you, you wanted to speak up and you didn't because of because you knew like. Uh, you know, I mean, it's hard for me to really remember how all that went. You know, I'm sure I made political points that they probably didn't agree with and so on. You know, I can't recall. I mean, they, they were not going to confront me with any overt racism um, because they wanted to keep the relationship and I wanted to keep the relationship. So they weren't going to they weren't they weren't going to provoke me. And I did not uh, see them as a mission field that I was there to preach to. I mean, I agreed to the I agreed to the deal myself. I mean, and this was mostly unspoken, but I agreed myself that we just won't talk about this in order to sustain some measure. Now, you know, in, in later years, some of that got um, ran into more in, into some greater difficulties. And, you know, when we got away. As time, as time went on, I mean, ultimately, I, I got married to a black woman. And my, my dad was dead by then, but my mom wouldn't come to, uh, come to the funeral. And, not the funeral. <laughs> yeah, I guess she saw it as a funeral. <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah, uh, slip of the tongue. Did she speak to that? Did she tell you her feelings? Yes. 
I mean, I, yeah, well, yeah, I wrote her a letter and told her what I was going to do and told her about my the woman I was getting married to and who and what she was and what her family was like. And, you know, she, she was in the process. She had just been accepted in the PhD program at Indiana University in journalism, and her family had always been educators. Her father was a coordinator of the graduate, uh, assistant coordinator of the graduate school at Jackson State. And, uh, you know, there was, uh, there were no, if anything, if there were any class differences, Carmen's, Carmen's uh, was, was uh, of a higher class than we were. Uh, but, uh, you know, she just, she was, she was very anguished, uh, very, very, very hurt, very disturbed, and, you know, just sent me a letter essentially begging me not to do it and uh, letting it be known that she couldn't accept it and, you know, wouldn't be, in, wouldn't be involved with it. Um, do you have any children? I do. Um, how did your mother react in learning that? Oh, you so Carmen and I didn't have uh, natural children uh, together. Uh, she had three kids. Uh, when we got married. She had three kids prior marriage uh, when we got married. And, uh, you know, I helped, uh, helped raise them. And I had kids by a prior marriage as well. Uh, but Carmen, Carmen's, Carmen's kids, of course, lived, lived with us. And, and uh, you know, I was involved in, with them, still am. Did your, was your mother, like, more accepting of your first marriage versus your second marriage? Yeah, she didn't have any problems with that. I mean, when I was marrying white people, <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a that's another interesting thing. Um, um, you know, about white Southern society is, is that um, folks who, who who we might characterize as race haters, and in some ways were, and certainly were people that were complicit with sustaining the culture of oppression of black people. Uh, were not within the white cultures in which they functioned uh, hard-nosed, uh, brittle, hating kind of people at all. I mean, you know, my, my, my family, my grandparents, I mean, they were all among the kindest, uh, most benevolent, caring kind of people that you could possibly imagine as long as it was among white folks uh, in the family and, and white folks. And as I said, as a part of this more or less Southern historical, historical elite, uh, D'Angelo's nice racists, uh, you know, they, they, they were, they were, they were uh, what you might call kind to uh, the black folks that came into the to the arena, as long as the black folks behaved themselves and didn't want anything that they weren't prepared to give. Um, you know, I became friends later on with some of the people who had worked for my grandparents. And, uh, you know, they had, they had uh, caring relationships that went both ways, but it was within the framework of an apartheid society where, where black folks were accepted and appreciated only within the very narrow framework, behavioral frameworks that were allowed. Uh, are you currently a member or, or financial supporter of any social justice or advocacy organization? Uh, if so, which one and what motivated you to become a member or supporter? Of, of what now? Are you are you currently a member or financially supporter or financial supporter of any social justice or advocacy organization? Uh, if so, which one, and what motivated you to become a member or a supporter? Well, you know, I mean, as you all know from from the birth date you asked me to give you, you know, my wife, my life has covered a long span of time, you know, and um, I, you know I've been part of. Uh, of just about every progressive organization that's ever reared its head in Mississippi, but you know, I was part of various new, new left organizations nationally. I worked in uh, in national uh, uh, third party campaigns, uh, efforts to build third party uh, efforts, uh, one sort or another. Uh, relationship with the old New American movement, and uh, Arthur Canoy, who was a 
famous civil rights, civil liberties lawyer during civil rights days, and I were close friends and worked in several organizations that he uh, sponsored. Uh, one of them was called the Mass Party Organizing Committee. Uh, and the Mass Party was about 13 of us, uh, you know, sometimes 30. <laughs> but we had good, we, we had uh, we had good intentions. One of the things that happened in that period of time was uh, there was a right, an extreme right wing uh, congressman from Georgia named Larry McDonald, who was later killed in a, when the, they shot down when the Koreans shot down a American aircraft over over North Korea. Some other big national scandal. McDonald died in that crash, but. Somehow he had gotten a hold of one of the pamphlets that we had published for the Mass Party Organizing Committee called uh, An Open Letter to Organizers and Activists in which we were calling for multiracial cooperation among groups and interest groups to, to build a national party, progressive political party. And uh, uh, a number of us who were in the leadership of that organization had signed it on the back. And it was, you know, it was, it was making arguments for democratic socialism and other things that were uh, not uh, pleasing to Larry McDonald. And uh, so he, he, uh, he, uh, he, he read my name into the congressional record as an enemy of the country because I had signed, because I had signed the back of that, which I'd always thought was sort of a, uh, a medal of honor. Uh, I, mean, I remember saying at the time, I wish we were doing something effective enough to have, to have deserved it. <laughs> What about currently? Are you currently a member or supporter of any social justice organization? I am really not uh, uh, an active member. Um, trying to think if, if I've got membership in anything, it's still uh, still standing. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I've been dabbling around in Unitarian Universalism which is a whole, another whole long story I will definitely not get into, but I've been involved with their allies for racial equality, so I suppose I'm a member of that. Um, but that's just fiddling around with a tiny little sliver of Americana that, that, that doesn't matter. And, I'm, and I'm, I have affinity, I have an affinity for, uh, for, democratic, uh, for democratic socialist, uh, socialist of America. I used to be a member of the DSA, and I was a member of a subgroup called the uh, religious, what was it? Uh, uh, religious Socialist of America. Uh, and so, you know, I've, I've been involved in those kind of things nationally and, and generally. I, you know, in, in, in the later years, I've quit identifying, uh, not, not that I mind being identified as a socialist, but I've quit uh, pushing an associate's identification any kind of upfront way just because it carries so much baggage. I'm a, I'm a pragmatist when it comes to politics. And, uh, you know, still militantly committed to progressive aspects of politics, you know. Pretty excited about, about Bernie's thing, although I kept trying to tell people that were saying Bernie was far left, that Bernie is a New Deal centrist. He's just a Democrat, you know. I mean, <laughs> he, uh, so, I mean, yeah, and I've given money to some of those things, although so now that I'm not working anymore, I don't have much money to give to anything. But I'm involved in progressive causes, and we've got, uh, it's been, you know, I've been very involved in, in trying to rekindle the flame of activism. You know, after after Trump was elected in 2016, we had a whole lot of, of activism in this area, in Oxford, Tupelo, and around. Um, much of it led by women's groups, um, but, uh, you know, Indivisible, for example, we had active chapters of Indivisible in Oxford and in Tupelo, and we played. In, uh, in those organizations. And uh, so much of what I do now is try to rekindle some of the flame, try to fan the embers that are left of those flames from 2016 uh, into a new stage of activism to try to address some of the things that are going on in our world right now, which are almost overwhelming to just about everybody. And, and, and people got tired, you know, and in Mississippi, telling people to write your Senator, right? Your congressman is such a futile waste of time. Uh, you know, we, <laughs> I remember when John Conyers used to be in the Congress, uh, you know, a Democrat from uh, Detroit. I used to write John and 
say, John, look, we don't have any representatives in Congress. Here's the things we're concerned about. You have to be Mississippi's represent <laughs> movement, Mississippi's representative in, uh, in in Congress. But we put the, we put the, we were we were able to compile the list of all the organizations, indivisible and and uh, and the women's groups and NAACP and other groups. Uh, that have been active in Oxford, and we pulled together an email list that we just simply call the Progressive, uh, the, the Progressive Citizens Network. We don't meet, we don't have any dues, and we don't have any membership, but we've got this list of folks that just about everybody who's ever had a twinkle in their eye in Lafayette County that we use to try to call people into uh, to actions and uh, provide educational material and other things too. To, try to rekindle something that looks something like a progressive movement or an alternative or, you know, I mean, it's, uh, people talk about being burnt out and how futile it often seems, you know, and, uh, you know, so we, uh, we, we say, well, you know, I, I, I like to quote an old Presbyterian theologian, Robert McAfee Brown, who used to say, if nothing else is important, take a stand against evil. <laughs> even, even if it's even if, if you can't uh, find a way to make it effective, so I ask, I say we're gonna we're gonna show up down here and take a stand against evil if, if if we change anybody's mind or not. But we but we but we we've had a a, a group a, a, of an informal network of group, a group of people talking seriously about how we build a long term progressive political base for the state of Mississippi as well an interracial progressive. Uh, Political base, which is important uh, for for us to do, because we need to uh, we need to have a long term strategy and institutionalize that strategy so that we're moving in that direction and have some conception of uh, of uh, a different at least having a force for progressive politics in the state, which we had back in the days of the Freedom Democratic Party and then later the Loyalist Democratic Party, which were Democratic parties outside the Mississippi Democratic Party that was able to put sufficient pressure on the national party that we made some some gains and even even had some fairly decent uh, state legislation passed at one time or another. But since the death of the, the Loyalist Party and, and the FDP, uh, you know, we have not had anything like that in Mississippi. So part of our strategy is the notion of rebuilding, rebuilding something like that that could sort of be an in, in and out of the Democratic Party that could run candidates separate from Democrats when we had good candidates and they had bad candidates and could support candidates within the party when they were able to come up with good candidates. So, but anyway, we're, we're working on it. I, I, I don't have a particular primary organizational affiliation anymore uh, like that. But partially it's because there have been very, very few effective organizations that have been sustained in the state. What protests have you participated in, and can you talk about your experience? To try to recall, I mean, there's hardly ever been a protest that I haven't participated in, um, both, both here and, and nationally, you know. I mean, we, we protested Nixon's doings in Washington over and over again, and, uh, and, 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 and it just as recently as, I, you know, which I, said the Ukraine vigil and, and the, the, the post row decision rally and the, the gun control rally. And, you know, we're, we're trying to uh, do voter turnout stuff. And, uh, you know, I mean, all of those things involve some form of protest, either, organi either organizing for resistance or rallying and marching and doing stuff for resistance, but trying to be part of an overall uh, effort to let people know that not everybody in Mississippi is crazy as hell. Have you ever witnessed any violence at a protest or rally? If so, can you describe what happened and how you felt? I, I don't recall in Mississippi um, having situations that turned into actual physical violence. There have been a lot of face-offs with uh, Klan and Nazi people. They were mostly screaming sessions and, and what have you. And, you know, I mean, I, 
got knocked off the sidewalk by some cops <laughs> at King's funeral. You know, I mean, there've been uh, those kinds of expressions of violence, uh, you know, where you get minor things that were going on. Most of what I know is the same thing everybody else knows and uh, from, uh, from watching television. Uh, we, had, we had an Antifa contingent here for a recent uh, Klan confrontation over the uh, Confederate statue on the, uh, at Ole Miss. And, uh, and I was uh, involved in the pilot group that was meeting with, with them uh, and with other people uh, to, to do that Klan confrontation. And I've been a pretty big apologist for Antifa in general. I mean, you know, I just I tell people, you know, that we went through a period when they were hitting us hitting our folks over the head with ax handles for trying to exercise basic civil rights, civil and citizenship rights. We got tired of getting hit over the head. <laughs> you know, and, and black folks certainly did, you know, and organized deacons for defense and Black Panther Party and, and uh, Roy Williams' uh, organization in North Carolina, I can't think of his name, but we, we came up with self-defense uh, uh, mechanisms to, uh, to help put a quietus on just standing there and getting getting beat up. Deacons, uh, Deacons for Defense and Freedom. What? Deacons for Defense and Freedom. Yeah, okay. And, uh, you know, the, uh, so, uh, so I, I, I felt that Antifa, and certainly at Charlottesville, if you know anything about what they did in Charlottesville, they played an enormously positive and productive role in Charlottesville and, uh, and letting those goons know that uh, if they're going to attack us, they may have to pay a price. Uh, it, in my view, is a very positive thing to have. <laughs> I don't know whether I've got guts enough to, to wade into the fray or not. I hope I, I would if I, if I had to, but uh, I, I think the, having the capability is certainly an important thing. How did, your, how did your wives feel about your activism? What was, the, what was sort of their response to your militant activism? Well, you know, I was married when I got thrown out of my church, and, uh, and my wife shared some of the uh, experiences, uh, you know, attended some of the Jackson meetings of the Council on Human Relations and met some of the people that I met. So she had some, uh, I wouldn't say that she, that she became, you know, a civil rights activist in her mind necessarily, but she understood what I was doing and was basically supportive. <laughs> during that period. Um, of course, when Carmen and I got married, you know, she'd been, um, you know, and, and being raised in, in, in the black community in Jackson had been, you know, privy to things going on there. So basically, I, I wasn't, wasn't in any kind of uh, unsupportive marital relationship. Uh, in your view, what is whiteness? <laughs> well, gosh, that's uh, that 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 is that, that's such a loaded question, you know. I mean, at, at, at one at one level, of course, both whiteness and blackness are social constructs that we've invented to uh, to support uh, uh, inequities that we're fond of. Um, answered like a true sociologist, if but, I may. Answered like a true sociologist, <laughs> if I may. <laughs> the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the history of the United States is a history of, of white, um, anti-black racism and exploitation from well before the founding of the country. Uh, going back to these times when most of the folks black and white coming over were kind of indentured servants, or some of the black folks were brought as permanent slaves, but were working with with white people and others who were indentured servants, and and uh, there are extremely interesting historical stories of the extent to which the white communities in New England went to be sure that black and white labor-related 
cooperation didn't develop, and it did develop uh, in many, began to develop in many places in those um, indentured and, and enslavement work, uh, work farms. And uh, there were uh, incidents of white folks essentially being crucified on the roadside to teach white folks that they needed to stay white and not, uh, and not be uh, finding common cause with black folks around economic and, and, and social realities. And, that, and, and out of that whole kind of a, of, a, of a mindset, you know, it wasn't just Mississippi in the 1960s or 50s or the 40s, you know. <laughs> it's, it's something that runs deeply in our national psyche and into the founding of the country. And um, so the, the, the uh, we have to find ways to talk about these realities um, that, that make uh, persuasion of the persuadable possible. Um, and, and, and that means essentially not starting out with a goal to demonize folks or, or to create guilt, but to find ways to help people understand what's going on, and that's not an easy thing. And the dismantling racism workshops are one way to try to do that, to try to develop a common terminology and to get everybody sort of on, develop a common language for talking about race that, that uh, makes it possible to, uh, to make some, some gains. And, and where you don't have any of that kind of common terminology, it, it, it's, it's much more, more difficult to do. Uh, what was the question I've, I've talked myself? <laughs> In your view, what is whiteness? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but the entire uh, three-fifths of the person in the Constitution and the whole way that the Constitution was set up and later honored the, the, the unrehabilitated Southern oligarchy uh, has resulted in a national um, climate of white supremacy that is taken to be uh, normal. Uh, it's taken to be the cultural norm uh, into which we might possibly graciously integrate uh, folks of different skin colors and different persuasions, and uh, and it's it's um, it's something, and, and and it may may or may not be worse in the South. Uh, tell you a story about work I did with National Black Political Assembly. If we, if we can get to it later, but you know it, it may be may, may may be worse in the South, different in the South. Go uh, ahead. Go ahead and in, in, in some ways, but uh, um, but it's not just a Southern problem. I mean, we live, to characterize the culture as a white supremacist culture is not a mischaracterization. I'm working on ideas and some of this within that Unitarian Universalist thing I'm working on um, about how to best communicate that reality in ways that, uh, that can be heard uh, because, you know, most white folks in Mississippi are not reading Robin DiAngelo and Abraham Kendi, right? Uh, uh, they're, they're, they're not reading anything. They're not thinking much about it. And, and even, the, even the ones who are not, uh, even, even white people who are not uh, overtly bigoted people, uh, and, 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 and who probably don't look with favor on the Klan, you know, or the neo-Nazis necessarily in a sort of an abstract way, uh, are not people who have thought through this so that they can become, in any sense, part of a real mass base for a solution. You know, I mean, the, the, the difference that Kendi makes in his, uh, his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, between not a racist and an anti-racist. And you know, and a lot of folks haven't even quite gotten to the not a racist place. They're sort of a sort of a not a bigot, but haven't thought much about it and pretty comfortable and not worried about it much one way or the other until they tell us we're being threatened by violence. <laughs> kind of a kind of a place. So so trying to uh, trying to find productive language uh, with integrity that doesn't sell out the sell out the store. Uh, uh, is an important part of what you know, part, part of what we have to do in order to be effectively anti-racist. Because you know, we, we want people who are fighting, changing policy and law, 
and rights and, and, uh, and inclusion and participation. And, you know, those, 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 you have to get beyond just simply the dismantling of, of the racist mind and get beyond the grief and get to seeing where the rubber hits the road in terms of black people's ex actual practical everyday experience. Uh, you know, so whiteness is a culture. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a way of life. It has to be realized, and white people have to realize how it, uh, it, it, uh, it conveys complicity upon you as in the form of various forms of, of privilege that, uh, that we have to find ways to, uh, to consciously renounce and to, to, to seek uh, rebalancing mechanisms within, within culture and politics to, uh, to make change. Within your sort of thought about your view of whiteness, you mentioned white supremacy. Um, how do you view white supremacy? What is sort of your understanding of what white supremacy is in relation to whiteness? Is it, is there overlap? Are they, are they the same thing? Or is there a difference between the two? Well, I suppose technically speaking, white supremacy is a conscious, conscious belief that white people are superior to, to people of color. Um, based purely on skin cover, color, uh, and maybe uh, some kind of notion of uh, historical accomplishment. Uh, but, you know, so technically it's a conscious belief in, 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 uh, in, in perhaps the, uh, the articulation or teaching of that, uh, of that view. But, but, the, but that view has resulted in such powerful cultural practices that that you, uh, that the difference between a conscious, technically person, technically committed to intellectually to intellectual white superiority, and a person who may not have have that same level of intellectual consciousness in terms of the practices that they engage in behaviorally in the culture, there's really not much difference. So when you, when you say the white supremacist culture, essentially you else you're talking about all white people who are socialized, <laughs> and you say, oh, there might be an exception. <laughs> Larry, Larry might have had a little bit different situation. He didn't have a different situation growing up in Philadelphia uh, in a Jewish family than I had growing up in Avery, Mississippi with my family. Uh, but we're all, all of us who have a white skin culture are acculturated and socialized into white, into white ways of thinking and to white expectations and to those white expectations and practices representing the normal, the, def the defining normal, into which other people may or may not be uh, included, both socially and in terms of political empowerment. I hope I'm answering the questions. I you are. <laughs> uh, what advice would you give individuals who self-identify or can be externally categorized as white regarding participation in social justice movements, organizations, or protests? I do not know that I experience any white people who consider themselves white supremacists that are trying to get into uh, uh, anything progressive. Uh, I, you know, that's almost an oxymoron. I mean, they're getting into uh, uh, T-Rumpism, and the like, you know, and Tea Party and uh, all, all the, uh, the crazinesses that are going on on the right wing. But I don't, I don't see, I mean, you know, it's um, when you, uh, you know, where you engage that is with white people who, who do not consider themselves white supremacists and who view themselves one way or the other as, um, um, favorable toward racial progress, you know, as most white liberals do, whether they're doing anything about it or, or not, you know. Black comedian Dick Gregory used to say, a white liberal is a person who will hang you from a low limb. You know, I don't know whether you're familiar with that, uh, with that saying or not. Uh, but um, it's just, you know, we, we exist, and, 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 I, and I am really engaged in this more now than I have historically trying to find ways to deal with folks who think of themselves as really well-intentioned, good folks who are 
completely revolted by the idea that anybody would think they were racist, and mostly probably revolted by the idea that anybody would think they had white privilege, which is, you know, the, which is the hurdle that you have to get over with, 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 with white liberals to get, uh, to get to the point where you can begin to make any progress with them on, on the issues. But, um, I mean, that's where you engage it. You don't engage it with white, conscious white supremacists. I mean, I'm, I'm not one who thinks there's a hell of a lot to be engaged by shouting across the field at Klan's people, but I do it from time to time. Uh, you know, I mean, that's, that's not my idea of how we, how we make uh, social change, but that's my interaction with white supremacists, you know. I mean, when I ran the Hunger Coalition in Mississippi, I got threatening calls from Nazis and Klan's people all the time. I mean, you know, it was just part of it. Now, I would engage them. I mean, I, I, uh, those were the days when we didn't have cell phones. I mean, everybody's landline was listed in the city directory, right? I right? said so they wanted to call you up, they would. You know, and I just say, well, I said, well, you know, you guys, y'all are, are not wrong about needing to take the country back. I said, y'all just try and take it back from the wrong people. Y'all are trying to take it back from people who don't run it. <laughs> I, said, I said, there are some folks up, up there who own, own, own the country that, uh, that we need to be working on, but y'all are not in the right fight. But, you know, that, that was all fun and games. I mean, they weren't going to, I wasn't trying to persuade them of anything. I was just, just playing with them. But, uh, I don't I guess another way to phrase that question is, what advice would you give to the next generation of individuals who self-identify or can be categorized as white regarding their participation in social justice? The thing I say to young white people is, don't waste any of your life and energy fighting the Civil War. <laughs> you know, I said, that fight's over. I said, you know, don't fight the Civil War. Don't spend your time and energy worrying about who somebody's going to love because of their, their, their sexual identity. Uh, you know, let's all find a way to make this society flourish for everybody together. Uh, so, uh, you know, and, and depending on where it goes, you know, you, you, can, you can get into uh, to, to dismantling racism uh, kinds of talks, you know, and you can advise them. As Walter advised me, uh, be willing to listen to what what black and oppressed people and people oppressed in various ways in our society are saying, even when it's uncomfortable. Learn from them because if we care about humanity, and we we and we care about the uh, what we have euphemistically called the common good, uh, uh, the, the 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 mutual web of uh, of existence in which we're all involved, as King put it. Uh, uh, you know, we, we, we need to listen to the people that are hurting, find out why they're hurting, and find out what we can do to unhurt, to, to create unhurt in those situations so that we can be mutually enriching and mutually flourishing in the society we're trying to build. And give you time to that. Don't, 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 don't fight the Civil War over again. Um, can you sort of speak to the uh, initiatives and your involvement in the initiatives that are underway here in Holly Springs um, to sort of raise awareness and bring to the forefront the African-American culture and history uh, in this community? Well, most of my involvement in Holly Springs has been as an employee of Rust College um, for a long time. Um, and I, all the time that I've been employed in Rust College, I've actually lived in Oxford uh, where my wife, where we came because my wife was joining the faculty at Ole Miss. Uh, but I have, have, have tried to be involved in the affairs of Holly Springs um, as, as fully as, as I can. There, there has, hasn't been for a long time an active uh, civil, uh, definable civil rights organizational effort in Holly Springs, except for the NAACP, which has been, you know, fairly progressive, but mostly involved in Democratic Party politics and school issues, uh, and uh, you know, so I, my, 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 my involvement has been primarily in areas of what we are, what we call. Then this is something I did in Appalachia and various other places when I worked for the Choctaw Indians and other places is what we call low-income economic development, trying to. Uh, help develop economic alternatives in low-income communities, small businesses and, 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 and co-ops and, and the like. Uh, to, uh, 
And uh, when uh, uh, Eddie Smith, when the first black mayor of Holly Springs was mayor, uh, I worked in several of the initiatives that he started along that line, economic development things and trying to uh, um, rehab the old Mississippi Industrial College campus and turn it into a, into a city uh, uh, property and uh, city auditorium for things that were going on. Uh, just trying to remember, you know, there have been marches and things that I've uh, participated in uh, in Holly Springs. I've been part of Community Development Corporation. Um, the, uh, I'm involved in the organization that Larry has uh, started here called North Mississippi Roots and Wings that has uh, aspirations, long-term aspirations to do community education across racial lines to try to better race relations in the city of Holly Springs. So I'm keeping my finger in the pot here, but most of my activism these days, these days, uh, since I've left Rust, is uh, is in Oxford rather than Holly Springs. Um, recently, there was a, an initiative to change the name of Memphis Street here in Holly Springs to Ida B. Wells Boulevard. Well, were you involved in that process, the meetings? What is your view of? Yeah, not really. I, I was aware of it and, of course, supportive of it, but I wasn't really involved in it. That, that happened after I left Rust, and I just wasn't here enough to uh, to play okay. a, a real role. Um, and then, so the last question I had <coughs> is if you could speak to your activism in Oxford and what you're doing. Well, there. I think I've pretty well covered that with, uh, you know, both historically and uh, and with what we're trying to do I, now. I, I pray, okay. Okay. So I think that's all the questions I have. Does somebody have anything else to ask? All right, let, let, let me circle back uh, and pick up what I started to say about the National Black Political Assembly because it fits sort of into some of the stuff that we talked about. Uh, in 75 and 76, when Jimmy Carter became the, a candidate for president, uh, most of us white progressives and folks in SCAF and around were extremely skeptical of Carter. We felt like he represented a, uh, an image of a new South that was more image than reality, and that his governorship in Georgia had not led us to believe that he was the kind of person that we necessarily wanted to uh, see be president of the United States. Uh, so we did some organizing against Carter and, and, and uh, talked about his record and about the whole new South mythology which is a whole field of study in which you may be aware of, um, and, 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 and did that stuff on the local level around Mississippi. Uh, although some of our upper class white folks who had been involved in the council and other were big card supporters, some of them ended up working for his administration, including Hodding Carter, who had been the editor of the Delta Democrat Times, and Pat Darian, who at one time had been the director of the Council on Human Relations worked in his foreign policy apparatus. So some of the folks, more upper class white folks, and were, were big card supporters, but most of us white radicals were opposed to it. But during that time, the, the National Black Political Assembly decided they were going to try to mobilize a Julian Bond for president campaign. And at that time, I was involved in a lot of new left activities in New York and Washington. And, um, and so uh, Ron Daniels, who uh, was, was who had been a faculty member in, uh, out in Ohio, uh, was the uh, head of the National Black Political Assembly. And so he asked, uh, asked me to, uh, to travel across the North, North Midwest to talk to white and, and interracial groups about a Julian Bond for president campaign. And, you know, most of those new white groups, I mean, new white, most of those new left groups were, were all or predominantly white. They were aspirationally multiracial, but in fact, were mostly not. Um, but my, my task was basically to try to uh, speak to those folks and, and build support for uh, a Julian Bond for president campaign. And I forgot, it started in Chicago. Never will forget it. Uh, a friend had loaned me a Volkswagen Beetle, a little red Volkswagen Beetle. 
and we'd been in some kind of a meeting for several days in the cold of winter. When I went out to uh, to uh, get the to get in the car to start my my sojourn, uh, it was actually in a block of ice. I actually had to chop the ice off of that little bug to before I could even open it and get into it. You know, and, and, you know, as being the reliable vehicles they were, it did crank. But I, I, it was a rather inauspicious beginning. But I talked to a group two in Chicago, you know, and I and I traveled across state, you know, and uh, what I, what I ran into was uh, I'd speak to a group and they'd say, well, Don, uh, that's real interesting and, you know, and, 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 we, you know, and we're interested, but Indiana's a mighty conservative state. And then they would say, well, that's good. You know, and then the next state, well, that's good, Don, but Ohio is a mighty conservative state, right? And uh, Pennsylvania, conservative state. New Jersey, I mean, in every state, they said, you know. So when I got back, my report to Ron Daniels was, I said, Ron, the entire nation is Mississippi. <laughs> so I thought that little vignette would maybe fit into the other things we'd said. <laughs> is there anything else you'd like to add to the record? We the entire discuss? nation is still Mississippi. <laughs> I'd like to thank you so much, Don, for, for taking this time uh, to participate. Uh, I'd like to thank you for sharing this time and space with all of us. Uh, it was truly an honor uh, to hear about your experience, uh, and I'd like to conclude the interview at this point. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay. You walk in. I've never seen. I've never seen.